I love movies. Ever since I was a kid, my favorite form of entertainment has always been movies. Having a long story told to me, that's my first slide, by the way. <laughs> Having a long story told to me with visuals accompanying it was always right on my alley of enjoyment. And as I grew older and became more interested in storytelling and writing, I was able to see what an incredible form of artwork film was. The time and effort needed to create a film is immense. It takes hundreds of trained workers. You need actors, writers, cinematographers, set managers, designers, artists, and many more jobs, all with one director leading them on their way to a successful project. It takes about half a year to create a good screenplay, 30 to 60 days to do all the filming, and then six months to multiple years to do the post-production editing of a film. So in total, it can take many, many years to create a film, but it's only a two-hour theater experience of what you get at the end of it. With movies being such a massive project to make, there's thousands of things that can go wrong. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. A director's choices, every single one will either push audiences away or pull them in. And when a director messes up, he has the choice to either learn from it or not learn from it and sulk on it. And so I'm going to be talking on when directors have learned from their mistakes and past mistakes of other directors and how we, just like directors, can change our, I guess, our movies of our lives in the future and learn from them. So we're going to start with CG, talking about the use of CGI in movies. CGI stands for Computer Generated Images and is used to enhance uh, the screen in post-production to create fantasy or unrealistic elements in the movie. CGI was first introduced in the sequel to Westworld, Future World, in 1976 and was revolutionized in 1982 with the movie Tron. After, this, after Tron was created, the whole new world was opened up to directors to use CGI. So let's have an honest moment. Who here likes Star Wars? Yep, everyone, good. <laughs> Star Wars is one of the, if not the, biggest franchise in the entire planet. When the, first, when the first prequel of Star Wars was released in 1999, The Phantom Menace, it was financially very successful, grossing over a billion dollars in the box office, but critically did very poorly amongst the fans. One of the biggest issues that I saw when reading most of the reviews was the extreme use of poor quality CGI. When you have a real life actor standing next to a fake character, if they look bad, it's very easy to tell, and it can suck you out of the movie's immersion, because you immediately know, that's not real, what am I looking at? And a prime example of this, if you ask any Star Wars fan, is the infamous Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> right in the middle, that guy there. He was infamous for being one of the worst animated CGI characters of all time. Very annoying dialogue, not a great character in my opinion. Because of this, it dragged the film down. Every scene that you saw him in, you immediately knew you weren't in the movie's world anymore. You were now in a theater watching something on a screen. A more recent example of poor CGI use was the film Jupiter Ascending. This was made by the Wachowskis, the siblings who were responsible for the famous Matrix franchise. This film was a financial and critical failure. It made $190 million, but was estimated to take over $210 million to create. Critically, it was panned by many for its overuse of CGI. One of the biggest problems was that you never felt like you were in a real situation because there was so much CGI. One of our most climactic scenes in the movie, our main protagonist is falling down a ledge into a city below with explosions around her. It's very heart pounding, except it's not because <laughs> when you're looking at it, you can tell nothing is real. The only thing real in this shot of the movie is our hero. You can you look around, the explosions aren't real, the city's not real, and it sucks you out when there's too much CG in a movie. So let's talk about where directors have learned from this. The first example, in 2008, we see Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight. This movie was a financial and critical success, grossing over a billion dollars in the box office and being praised by many for its fantastic acting, stunts, and practical effects. Christopher Nolan decided to avoid CGI as much as possible and make everything as real as possible. One scene in which a car crashes, instead of having a CGI car crash and tumble, they bought a real 
a real Lamborghini Murcielago and crashed it, which makes car fans cry a little, but it's worth it for the movie. And another scene, one of the most famous in the whole movie, is when our main villain blows up a hospital building. So instead of using, taking the easy route and animating a building blowing up, they took the hard route. And they blew up an actual building. You only get one shot to do this. Uh, I don't know if you guys know how hard it is to rebuild a building, but it only takes a few seconds to blow it up. Another film that relies heavily on practical effects is Alexandro Gonzalez Inarito's The Revenant, released in 2015. This movie took audiences to amazing sites, going to extreme natural environments in the wildernesses of Canada to film. Every single member there reported that they had frostbite many different times. It wasn't an easy journey for them to film this movie, but at the end they said that it was worth it. And it was. It won them awards, including Alexandre Gigan Inarito, the award for best director that year. One of the prime examples of this is a scene where our main character, Leonardo DiCaprio, is floating down a freezing river. This scene could have been done in a pool with green, screen, green screens to simulate a similar effect. But instead, Leonardo DiCaprio insisted that he actually jump in the freezing river. And not only that, his cameraman followed to get the best possible shot. Now that's not to say that CGI is a bad thing either. Both of these two last films didn't rely on it much, but there are good things that can come from it, even when using lots of it. Take, for example, 2014's Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Half of the main characters in this movie are CGI animated apes. And so, you're gonna have to use good CGI if you want it to look realistic. And they did. The studio behind this won many awards, including Best CGI Animation in a Film that year, and, and were nominated for many others revolving around their CGI animation. One scene in particular that many f fans of the series loved was this scene, in which a young boy stands next to an orangutan. Lots of people questioned whether the orangutan was real, because it looked so realistic compared to the young man next to him. But in reality, he was CGI animated. So as these directors have had to learn how to know when and how to use CGI, we're gonna talk about how horror movie directors have to try and keep the audience on their toes guessing what's gonna happen next. Because horror movies are one of the biggest genres in the film industry. There's no feeling quite like sitting in a dark room having fear rush down your spine with your friends there. It's terrifying, but it's so much fun. If you haven't seen a horror movie, go watch it. It kind of sucks the first time, but it's worth it. And after Alfred Hitchcock blazed the trail for horror movies, the film industry couldn't get enough. In more recent years, we saw, the cla we saw a film become a classic in horror movie fans' hearts, Paranormal Activity. This film was made on a minuscule budget of $11,000 and grossed over $100 million. It was, incredible, it was an incredible sight to see such a small project be so successful. But after this success, we saw predictability fall through. Every single film had the same method of fear, a jump scare, which is the film is very quiet and is building suspense up to a snap of a very loud noise and an image flashing in front of you quickly. And in the first Paranormal Activity, it was great and fans loved it. But when they made the second one, with a much bigger budget of $3 million, they grossed less money overall and got worse reviews. And then when they made the third one, with a bigger budget, they got less money and worse reviews. And this proceeded, I think there's like 80 paranormal activities now or something, but. So we saw a trend of predictability in almost all horror films. Because after the success of paranormal activity, so many other movies, such as Sinister, The Conjuring, The Bye Bye Man, all of these movies tried to follow with the same methods of fear, the jump scare. And without changing it up, it almost sense, there was almost this sense of predictability in all horror films. But these next films I'm going to talk about, going to talk about, tried to change it up and make it so audiences wouldn't know what was going to happen next. The first film being Insidious, which was actually made by the creators of Paranormal Activity. They learned from their mistakes with the Insidious franchise and added a few new tricks to try and scare the audiences. One of their biggest tricks, which is very popular, is a famous jump scare scene. The jump scare is going where our characters are just talking in a room, nothing is really happening that that's exciting. There's no suspense being built up. And all of a sudden, one of our characters sees something and begins to scream as our camera quickly cuts to a scary monster in the background. 
Now, it might just sound like a normal jump scare to some, but what it is, is just dropping you in. Most jump scares have a small lead up of suspense, but just like it dropped in our character in that scene, it drops in audiences to just this open nest of fear. You are now no longer safe in any portion of the movie. Any time that it was happy or sad or scary, you were open to a jump scare of some kind, and that left audiences with a sense of dread. This jump scare is so popular that after the rest of these talks, if you Google Insidious Jump Scare, you'll find it immediately. The next movie we're gonna talk about is an indie hit called It Follows. This movie was made on a small budget of $10 million and was very successful financially and critically. One of the critics' biggest praises was that it doesn't tell you almost anything about the monsters. And so you have a relation to these characters in the movie. They don't know anything, you don't know anything, there's a sense of panic. When people don't know anything, you kind of freak out for a moment. You don't know what to do. And so It Follows has this constant sense of panic throughout the entire film, and it follows it beautifully. The movie Lights Out did very well amongst fans for its very creative and terrifying monster effects and, dis and detail. The monster in the movie looks like this. I hope that didn't scare you too much. I can tell you guys are frightened. It has two main things about it because this is the way that you see it throughout most of the film. It has its long, crooked, thin silhouette and its two white beady eyes. The silhouette is made so that your mind imagines the scariest thing possible for yourself. It's kind of a show less, get more situation. The eyes are a deep contrast to the dark silhouette, which forces your own eyes to to focus on those and always be looking at the monster, making it harder to look away to ease the fear. All of these horror movies tried to change the game in some way, whether it be with a more exciting monster or not explaining anything to the audience or a different way to scare people with a jump scare. And they all learned it from their past failures, paranormal activity. So I don't want you to think that any of these films that I've talked about are 100% failures or 100% successes. They've all done things right and they've all done things wrong. But where they've all exceeded 100% is that people have learned from them. You're thousands of mistakes away from being good at something. You have to try something over and over and over again until you get it right. And that's why when a director is looking at his past films and the past films of other people, when he looks at the bad things, he's not looking to sulk on them and think, that was terrible of me, I should have never done that. He's looking to learn from them. He thinks, well, that's great, now I know what to do next time. And just like how we can do the same thing, we look on our past selves and we realize what we can change, what we can do next. I want you to keep shooting for your goals, no matter what they are, whether it be to someday become a director of a horror film or Dawn of the Planet of the Apes 17 or something. And I want you to keep trying for those goals. And even if you fail, don't think of it as a failure. Think of it as a great opportunity to learn and improve. Thank you.